Today I'm going to be talking about a counterintuitive but highly effective form of treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about post-traumatic stress disorder and a cognitive behavioral therapy for treating PTSD, which is the form of therapy that I use when I'm treating a client with PTSD. But before I get into that, just a couple of disclaimers to go over. I'm a registered psychologist in the province of British Columbia, Canada. And this video is for informational purposes only. It is not intended as a replacement or substitute for advice from your doctor or mental health professional. If you're enjoying my videos and would like to see more, please hit that subscribe button uh, and notification bell down below, and you'll be alerted every Thursday when I post a new video. Now with those things out of the way, let's start talking about a treatment for PTSD. Now the treatment I do for PTSD is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's a form of treatment that really focuses on the interrelationships between behavior, thought, and emotion. And the treatment for PTSD uh, is one that requires a person to really understand, or requires a client to really understand why PTSD happens and how these therapeutic interventions are actually going to help. Um, because without a good understanding of what's going on with PTSD or a good understanding for the rationale for cognitive behavioral therapy for PTSD, no one would actually want to do the treatment that I'm gonna be talking about. So uh, I did a previous video on kind of the, the cognitive behavioral explanation for why PTSD happens. So I'd highly encourage you to watch that video first um, because a lot of what I'm talking about in today's video won't make a lot of sense without that understanding. Now, one of the keys to understanding what happens in PTSD is that people try really hard to avoid reminders, triggers, or thinking about the trauma. And that is perfectly natural. It makes a lot of sense as to why a person wouldn't want to think about a past traumatic event because it can bring up a lot of emotions and feelings that a person had at the time. And that can be really distressing. But the problem is, the more you try not to think about something, the more you try to avoid thinking about something, the more you end up thinking about it. So the metaphor I like to use is, it's almost like you're trying to hold a beach ball underwater, and the more force and pressure you're pushing to hold that beach ball underwater, the beach ball keeps popping up. And so you have to then grab it and push it back underwater. The beach ball pops up, you have to grab it and keep pushing it back underwater. So it's not a very effective solution. So a much better solution is to take the air out of the beach ball. And that's kind of what uh, this treatment does is it it's almost like you can think about the emotion that a person experienced at the tri time of the um, the traumatic event is interlinked with the uh, the memories of the traumatic event. And so every time the memories of the traumatic event come up, it brings up the same emotions. And so uh, the treatment that I do aims at separating the two of those. So a person can have the thoughts without bringing up all of the same emotions or bringing up the same emotions to the same intensity or the same amount of distress. So one of the main components for treatment is something that's called prolonged imaginal exposure. And the idea of prolonged imaginal exposure is that I get my clients to write out a detailed script of the traumatic event in as much detail as possible. So uh, what a person was thinking, what a person was feeling, uh, as much sensory detail as possible, trying to reimagine and recreate um, what was happening 
during the traumatic event. Uh, one of the things I often get my clients to think about is to imagine that there is a tape recorder in their brain that's recording everything that they're thinking and experiencing during this traumatic event. And to get that down on a piece of paper as part of this script. Um, and the idea is, once a person has this script, is that they read over the script over and over and over and over and over again, multiple times on a daily basis. And the idea is by reviewing the script, it's going to bring up distress. It's going to bring up a lot of uh, anxiety and psychological distress, a lot of upset the first time you read it, the second time you read it, the third time you read it. But the more you read it, the more often you read it, what ends up happening is that the emotion starts to drain away and starts to drain out of the memory. Uh, the metaphor I use is that it's almost like watching a horror film over and over and over again, right? The, the first time you watched a horror film, it's really upsetting, it's really distressing, it's really bothersome. The second time you watch a horror film, it's really upsetting, it's really distressing, really sort of grotesque, could be even worse than the first time you watched it. But if you watch this horror film over and over and over again, by the hundredth time you've watched the horror film, it's probably not gonna be all that distressing anymore because you've experienced the horror film over and over and over again, and it's kind of drained the emotion out of it. The horror film hasn't changed one bit it's the exact same horror film that was the first time you watched it. But by the hundredth time you've watched it, you no longer have that same emotional reaction. Well, these trauma memories are kind of like a personal horror film. And so what we're doing in this prolonged imaginal exposure is by reviewing the script over and over and over again, it's draining the emotion out of it. And so uh, over time, what ends up happening is a person can have the memories of the traumatic experience and it doesn't bring up the same amount of emotion or psychological distress. And if the memory isn't bringing up the same amount of psychological distress or difficulties, then a person's not going to work so hard to try to not think about the traumatic event. And what we know is that if you're not working hard to try not to think about something, those thoughts tend not to come up as much. And so this prolonged imaginal exposure works in multiple ways. It works to try and to help reduce the distress associated with the trauma memory, but by reducing the distress associated with the trauma memory, it means that the trauma memory doesn't come up as much because you're not trying to suppress the trauma memory as much. Now, a second component to therapy that, that I do is while we're doing this prolonged imaginal exposure, while my client is reviewing the trauma script, uh, what we're doing is we're looking for what I call stuck points or parts of the trauma script that a person develops faulty uh, assumptions or beliefs about themselves, other people, or the world, right? So uh, one of the most common things that I'll see is uh, someone who was sexually assaulted. And one of the beliefs that they have that's maintaining their distress is, I should have worked harder. I should have fought off my, uh, my attacker harder. And so it was my fault that I allowed that to happen to me. Well, this is a really common assumption and faulty belief is that people often think that whatever they did was the wrong thing to do and that anything else they could have done would have resulted in a better outcome. But the problem is we don't know that to be true. So uh, by a person just being in my office, 
The only way they're in my office is if they're alive. So whatever the person did in that traumatic, traumatic situation, the traumatic event during that assault, whatever they did helped keep them alive. And so uh, just because I assume that if I had fought the person off, then that would have led to a better outcome. Well, how do I know that if I tried to fight the person off, it wouldn't have gotten worse? Maybe uh, they would have killed me if I'd fought. So the thing is, we, we often come at these memories or these trauma memories having a whole bunch of information that we didn't have at the moment that it was happening. And so it's almost like we're using this retrospective information to look back on it and say, yeah, but I should have done this instead. Well, how would I have known to have done that instead? I didn't have the information at the time. So as we're going through the trauma script, what we're looking for is these assumptions and beliefs that a person has that are maintaining their distress and really challenging the validity of these beliefs. Because that's one of the things that can really contribute to and maintain the distress of PTSD is that these traumatic events kind of change the way we view the world and we view ourselves and we view other people. And so before a person experiences a traumatic event, and this is the case for all of us, we all have assumptions and beliefs about the world. We have assumptions and beliefs about ourselves and other people. And so, for example, uh, I know logically that every time I get in my car and I drive somewhere, uh, there's a chance I could get into a serious motor vehicle accident. But deep down, I kind of have this assumption that that's not going to happen to me. That uh, when I'm driving from point A to point B, I'm going to get there just fine and I'm not going to have an accident. So that's where my assumptions are. But what can happen if I have a serious motor vehicle accident and a really traumatic motor vehicle accident is it shifts my beliefs and assumptions uh, about the world about motor vehicle travel to now be maybe a different extreme where now I believe that every time I get in my car, I'm at high risk of being killed in a motor vehicle accident. Well, that may not be true. And so uh, by having that belief that I'm at extremely high risk, it just maintains my anxiety, it maintains my distress. And so it's important to really challenge some of those assumptions and beliefs that stem from these traumatic events. Another thing about these assumptions and beliefs that's important to recognize is that sometimes these assumptions and beliefs are really adaptive in one environment, but aren't so adaptive when you're no longer in that environment. So I often see this with uh, soldiers or people who've been in combat. Uh, being hyper aware, uh, being suspicious of other people, being constantly on the lookout for danger or threat is really adaptive and actually makes a lot of sense if you're in a war zone. But those same types of assumptions and beliefs and behaviors are no longer adaptive when you're out of that war zone when you're in a place where there isn't danger and threat everywhere. But if you approach this new environment with the same rules that you had in the dangerous or threatening environment, it's going to continue to make you feel like you're in danger or threat now, even though there is no danger and threat. So really understanding, identifying, and challenging these beliefs and assumptions is a critical component of PTSD treatment. And it's uh, something that I do while we're doing the prolonged imaginal exposure. And the third component of treatment is uh, behavioral exposure. What can happen with PTSD is that uh, people will avoid triggers, they'll avoid situations, they'll avoid activities, they'll avoid people 
that uh, will br that tend to bring up memories of the traumatic event. And what that can end up doing is to make a person's world smaller and smaller and smaller. They avoid people, they avoid activities, they avoid doing things, uh, and what they end up doing becomes less and less and less. And this can be extremely interfering and disabling for a person. So after we've done the prolonged imaginal exposure, after we've challenged these beliefs and uh, gotten a person to uh, think about the world themselves and others in a bit of a different way, we then test that out by doing behavioral exposures, getting a person to uh, do exposures to situations that they have avoided because it brought up memories of the trauma and made them feel really distressed. So for people who've been in a serious motor vehicle accident, I'll get them to do exposures of driving and driving in different situations, driving near the scene where the accident happened. Um, for people who say were uh, you know, a bank teller who was uh, held up at gunpoint, uh, the idea is to get them to gradually do exposure to being near banks or going inside bank branches at first maybe different than the one where the uh, where the robbery took place and then eventually getting to uh, being back in the bank branch where the robbery took place uh, so the idea is uh, really facing these triggers and draining the emotion out of the triggers. Because again, the triggers bring up memories uh, which are distressing. And so by repeated exposure to the triggers, uh, it may bring up the memories, but because the prolonged imaginal exposure drains some of the emotion out of the memories, it's not so distressing. And so this behavioral exposure is really aimed at trying to reduce the amount of uh, impairment or negative impact that the PTSD has had on a person's life and allows their world to start getting a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger. So um, this cognitive behavioral treatment of PTSD, uh, I know it sounds uh, quite logical in theory, uh, and it is, and it, the thing I like about it is that it works. And there's lots of evidence to demonstrate that cognitive behavioral therapy for PTSD is one of the most effective treatments for PTSD. This exposure to the memories, exposure to uh, triggers, uh, challenging these stuck points, it's, uh, it's kind of the gold standard for treatment. Uh, but one of the problems is this can be really difficult. So um, it's one of the things when I'm working with my clients, I, I often highlight it's, it's kind of like that Buckley's cough syrup commercials, you know, the, it tastes awful, but it works. This type of treatment really does taste awful. It really is uh, a challenging form of treatment. And I always tell my clients this, um, it's not going to be easy, uh, but neither is living with PTSD. And so um, by doing this treatment, even though it's going to be difficult and even though it may make things worse in the short term, in the long term, uh, it can be really effective and can really help a person put these traumatic events uh, in, into their past, file them away, and so that they're not as distressing or interfering uh, or causing a person as much trouble or difficulty. So. I hope you find that helpful, a, a better explanation or understanding of how it is we actually go about treating PTSD. I'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas about this, so please leave me some comments down below. Uh, I read all of them and, and like to respond to any questions that come up. Thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video, and I will see you in the next one.